Welcome. I'm uh, Jay Bhattacharya. I'm a professor of medicine at Stanford University, and I'm, and I'm interviewing Professor uh, Sunetra Gupta from Oxford University and Professor Martin Kuldor from Harvard University. And we're going to be talking today about the topic of a herd immunity and its role in the right strategy to, to address the COVID epidemic. All right. So why, why don't we start with a very simple question. How does a disease, what's the life cycle of a disease in the population? Just any disease, not, not just, not just uh, SARS-CoV-2, but what's the typical life cycle of a, of, of, let's say, let's say a coronavirus in the population. It's, it's introduced and what happens? It's natural. Right. So it depends very much on whether that disease creates immunity. Not for how, for, no, sorry. It depends very much on whether that disease creates immunity. So for a disease like HIV, AIDS, where you just become infected for life, what happens is the infection grows slowly and eventually reaches a plateau. For diseases like COVID um, or measles, where you have immunity established upon infection, uh, whether it be for a three or four year period or lifelong, what happens is when the disease enters, um, you get a period when it grows slowly and then it accelerates and starts to grow quickly. And while it's doing this, the people in the population are getting infected and becoming immune. And so effectively, the pathogen, the bug, is using up its own resources. So it starts to grow quickly uh, at, at a certain point when, if you like, uh, there are enough people to cause the, a significant rise in infections. But then after a while, it uses up too much of its resources to keep continue growing so, as fast. by resources, you mean people who have not yet been infected? Correct? That's correct. Okay. And so uh, there comes a point where it, the growth slows down and becomes negative, and then eventually it dies down and will only return once the pool of susceptibles has been replenished. How does that happen? Well, it could happen through loss of immunity, or in the case of measles, for example, it happens when people who are immune die and new susceptible people are born into the population. Okay, so now let's, now we have, a, we have a picture of the life cycle of a disease. It's going up as people, as it's introduced and people people start uh, becoming infected. The, 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 the people that are infected meet the people that are uninfected. It spreads. Eventually, there's not enough infected people for it to continue spreading at a very high rate and starts to come down. That's the picture. Um, so, so uh, Dr. Kulov, what is what does herd immunity in that in the context of that picture? Um, so. Suppose that each person infects a certain number of other people, two or three people, say. Then, as uh, Dr. Gupta says, uh, when they're already infected and immune, then every new person who gets the disease will infect fewer people, or maybe only one, and then maybe only a half person, because the one patient would have been infected are already immune, so they won't be infected. And there is a principle that if if the average number of people that uh, are infected by those who get infected is above one, then every sort of cycle of more infectors will be more and more, and then it will rise. But, but if it's just below one, then if I'm infected, I might infect maybe one person or two, but then from probab probability and mathematics, it will eventually die out. So maybe a dozen people will get it, maybe only two, uh, but it will never grow up into a, uh, an epidemic with lots and lots of people are getting uh, infected. So once that threshold, uh, the reproduction number is less than one, then things will die out. If it's just below one, above one, then it will spread. So there's sort of a very key factor that of the above one or below one, and as more and more people get immune, it goes further down and eventually below one. So you used an, uh, uh, a term, term that's really important there, I think, and it's worth knowing, uh, exploring. You said reproduction number. So what is that? What is that number? 
So uh, there's uh, there's two things. One is the R not the reproduction number before any before anybody is immune, everybody's susceptible. So that's sort of the baseline, uh, and that's often can be high. But then that number changes over time. The a reproduction number is the average number of people that uh, uh, an infected person infects. So as the more immunity, then that number will go down and eventually be below one. And that's when the uh, epidemic eventually dies down. And if ever disappears completely, it will be endemic, but you won't have this uh, mass uh, infections. So, so, so Dr. Gupta, mm -hmm. does that mean that uh, if a, a disease is to, to be contained in a population, not everybody has to be infected, is that right? Absolutely, that's the, the sort of critical insight that we get from using, as it were, mathematical models to explore this kind of system, is we realize that once a certain fraction of the population is immune, this reproduction rate falls to below one. So there is a critical point at which it is exactly one, and that threshold is known as the herd immunity threshold. And what happens with all infections is they reach, they tend to that herd immunity threshold, and that's what we call the endemic equilibrium. So that's the point at which R is exactly equal to one. Now, of course, it doesn't stay there, it wobbles around that, but that's a state that can be sustained and, and maintained for an indefinite period. And in that condition, the numbers of infections are held at a level that we have generally come to accept as just how life is. Right. And the beauty of herd immunity is that then the herd immunity, the immunity of other people can actually protect those who are more vulnerable. So for example, in measles, we have a vaccine. So in, in measles, now with the vaccine, the vaccines uh, uh, help us create that herd immunity. But you can't take the measles vaccine unless until you're about 12 to 15 months old. Um, so those who are less than 12 months old, they could get measles and it's very serious, but the vaccine doesn't work for them. But they are protected by the herd immunity of the older children who gets the vaccine. So even though not every child is vaccinated, so not every child is immune, but uh, that herd immunity that's created is protecting those younger children who are not old enough to get the vaccine, as well as children who uh, might not be able to get it because they're immunocompromised or because they have parents who doesn't like to give them the vaccine. So all of them are still protected through the herd immunity created by the vaccines of those who do get it. So let me explore that just a bit further. So you, what you're saying is that if you have a vaccine, you create a, a set of people who, if I were to interact with them, I wouldn't get the disease. And that's protecting me. Correct. Yes. Right? So uh, even if you don't have a vaccine, even if you don't are immune, you're still protected. But this also arises through natural immunity. So um, we now have a vaccine for measles. And so what we do is we create the herd immunity without subjecting those who achieve herd immunity to the um, possible effects of infection as in disease and death. But natural immunity itself also gives you, achieves the same goal, where you have a lot of people who are immune and therefore the risk of infection is low. Um, you know, this is a, Martin gave a very good example of a vulnerable class who were protected, who were infants, but also there are adults circulating who have, for whatever reason, not had measles, and they too are protected um, because there is a sufficient herd immunity to keep infection rates low. Um, we know that measles, when it arrives in a population that is immunologically naive, a susceptible population, can really decimate these but also before there was a vaccine, we had herd immunity for measles because we will have an outbreak, and then at some point there were not enough people who were susceptible, and then we had herd immunity. But then, as new children are born, they are not immune. So at some point, there are more 
susceptible people and then we'll have a new outbreak. So in measles, we will have an outbreak and then we'll make maybe a couple of years and then there will be a new outbreak. But there was immunity in between there that then stayed until there were enough people, uh, children born again, to sort of create another outbreak. And it still happens, right? We still still see outbreaks of measles occasionally despite the vaccine. Yeah, and that's because uh, there might be a population where uh, mostly the vaccination rate is more than 95%, but if there's a population that has a lower vaccination rate, uh, then they will create an outbreak. And there was one in 2019 in the, in the summer because the vaccination rates went down and then there was a major outbreak with many, uh, many deaths. So, uh, is, you know, we've talked about measles. Uh, I'm going to turn to SARS-CoV-2 in just a minute, but I just want to end this conversation about the, about the you know, herd immunity in general. Uh, are there other viruses that, that don't have vaccines that have reached what you would call this, this threshold, this endemic le- level of uh, infection in the population where oh. we're, we're protected? Mm-hmm. Take the other four circulating uh, seasonal coronaviruses, for instance. Um, the hope would be that this new novel coronavirus would settle into a similar state where it circulates at an endemic equilibrium. So you get outbreaks every three or four years, I think, of particular coronaviruses. And um, the mortality overall it is kept low so we don't you know worry too much i mean it still it does kill people as do rhinoviruses common cold viruses so we have a whole bunch of viruses that are circulating um at an endemic equilibrium and it uh, unfortunately very sadly they do kill vulnerable people mm-hmm. but the risk is low enough that those that vulnerable people can enjoy a normal existence even with these viruses being Around. And even without and with, a vaccine. And with, without a vaccine. And with COVID-19, one feature is that, so, so once we have re- uh, received herd immunity, uh, then it's going to slow down, but then new children will be born and they will be susceptible, so they will not be immune. So then there will be uh, more cases. But uh, one thing with COVID-19 is that this is a very mild disease for children. So if you look at it in the long run, even if we don't have a vaccine, you would expect that most people will get it as a child and therefore it will not be very serious. Uh, so the long-term prospect in that sense, one shouldn't be too worried maybe about the COVID-19. And um, I mean, of course, one issue there is how long does immunity last to COVID-19? And if it is like the other coronaviruses, that would be five, 10 years. But So we might get these sort of epidemics, but there are two issues here. One is that the people who will be exposed to the virus in the, in the new epidemic will be the young, the newborns, who will be exposed for the first time. And for them, the risk is probably not terribly high from what we're seeing. And for those of us who might be re-exposed, again, it's likely, looking at the other coronaviruses, that reinfection will not carry the same risk of severe disease than death. And that's also true many other pathogens, but the second exposure does not carry the same risks. Right. I think in the early days of, of the coronavirus, the novel coronavirus epidemic, there was some worry about whether immunity actually was generated by infection. It sounds like that's not so much of a worry, but we, we've seen immunity in, in the context of infections in the corona, in, with SARS-CoV-2. Is that true? Yeah, I, w- I would certainly say yeah. so. Okay. How many reinfections have there been to date? Well, I mean, even if we had seen one or two reinfections, I mean, we know that people get reinfected with chickenpox. It doesn't, we don't immediately abandon the idea that you get lifelong immunity to chickenpox or measles or anything from the few incidents. Of we're talking about a very re- small number. Of yeah, a very small like number that. of reinfections do not indicate anything about the actual distribution. So, of so in that sense, the, the, when we're talking about SARS-CoV-2, it fits into the picture of natural history, the, the typical virus as you've described. It's not a, a virus from Mars. It's a virus that, uh, in that sense, we can set expectations from the modeling and the, and the kind of analysis you'd expect it. But eventually, you'll, it will go down, even without a vaccine, it will go down. Oh, yes, I think so. But I think it's, it's not, probably immunity is not lifelong. If 
we go by the other coronaviruses, but it's long enough that it will result in this endemic state where the number of people infected at any point in time might be a bit higher than measles, but the effects on people, the actual death toll, will be very So, so 